Trust. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Pengana Private Equity Trust webinar, focusing on our current one for three rights issue. My name is Russell Pulima, and I'm the CEO of Pengana Capital Group. It's great to have so many people attend today's session. We understand that your time is valuable and we very much appreciate your support. We're very pleased to have with us today three senior representatives from GCM Grosvenor, our investment partners based in Chicago, Fred Pollock, Jonathan Herstritz, and Corey Lepredi. The webinar will finish at 11 a.m. and towards the end, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please submit your questions by clicking on the box on the right-hand side of the screen. P1 is indeed a unique uh, vehicle as it's the only ASX listed vehicle that provides investors with exposure to global private equity markets. History has shown that private equity as an asset class has the potential to deliver strong returns for investors over extended time periods, returns that are in excess of listed equity markets. In addition, private equity has exhibited low volatility and low correlation with listed equities. The combination of these factors has resulted in private equity being considered by most large sophisticated investors to be an excellent addition to portfolio construction with the potential to both increase returns as well as reduce risk. The biggest impediment to investing in private equity is the inability of investors to gain access to top global private equity managers. Fortunately, P1 overcomes this impediment via our partnership with GCM Grosvenor, which enables us to get access to a wide array of some of the best private equity managers and deals around the world. Last Thursday, the offer was opened and it will close on July 6. The offer is a one for three rights issue, meaning that for every three units held as of the record date of 16 June, unit holders will have the right to subscribe for one new unit. Unit holders are also able to subscribe for additional units that have not been taken up by other unit holders under the rights issue. The offer price is equivalent to the net asset value of 125 per unit, resulting in a total offer amount of 68 million. It is important to note that valuations in the portfolio are mostly done quarterly in arrears, so that the net asset value of 125 per unit largely reflects underlying asset values as at 31 March, which was the low point in the equity markets. So we naturally expect uh, an uplift as uh, future valuations uh, come through. So why have we decided to do a rights issue at this point in time? The answer to this is that it is an ideal time to be making private equity investments. Due to the economic impacts of COVID-19, GCM is being, presented, is being presented with an abundance of excellent opportunities. And we think that adding these to the portfolio will significantly increase return for unit holders over the coming years. I note that PE1 is very fortunate in that going into the crisis, we had only invested approximately 30% um, of our funds under management with the remainder being held in cash. Today, a few months later, we have invested an additional 16% to take our total investment amount to 46%. And we've also earmarked a further 53% for specific investments and funds. Our portfolio is now fully committed and it therefore makes sense to raise additional capital to take advantage of new opportunities. We have been very pleased with investor demand since launching of P1 which is translated into our units generally trading at a strong premium to our net asset value. We are firmly committed to doing what we can to ensure that PE1 investors continue to benefit from having a strong unit price into the future. Finally, please keep in mind the important dates, especially the offer closing date of July the 6th. Um, I will now hand over to uh, Jonathan Herstritt, uh, from uh, GCF Grosvenor uh, to talk uh, about the portfolio. Over to you, John. Great, thanks, Russ. Pleasure to be with everyone and thanks for taking the time today. Uh, we at Grosvenor are very excited to continue to be part of the PE1 portfolio and uh, I've got my colleague Corey Lepretti on the line as well. Um, 
So on slide eight, what you'll see is just to remind everyone what we're trying to achieve here. So over a year ago, we created PE1. The goal was to create an institutional quality diversified private equity portfolio that was listed um, on the ASX um, with the goal of really creating kind of a secondary market of look, daily liquidity where buyers and sellers could transact based on kind of stated NAVs. Um, our goal was to provide a very balanced exposure to the different sub-strategies of private equity or implementation styles using primaries, co-investments, secondaries, as well as opportunistic private equity to make up the balance of the exposure with a very small amount of credit and cash um, as it's a highly dynamic evergreen portfolio that continues to recycle the investments so that you always have uh, the right exposure to private equity and can get the returns over the life of the cycle. Um, our goal is to be at any point in time, once we're through our four year ramp period, over 70% uh, look through exposure to private equity. And we think we can do that comfortably. And then we can talk a little bit later about the fees, but at the trust level, it's one and a quarter percent plus a 20% over an 8% per annum hurdle. Um, so maybe on slide nine, if we continue to go on, one of our goals here, again, was to highly diversify the trust so that you didn't have exposure to any one single fund, manager, geography, or underlying portfolio company. It was not our goal at any point to try and find the next Uber. Instead, we wanted to find um, a lot of names of middle market private equity companies that you would never have heard of, but are very good cash flowing businesses that uh, there's a very big market for. Um, what you'll see is that again, um, what we think at any point in time is that PE1 will have exposure to almost over 90 funds and almost 500 underlying companies. So this gives you ample diversification so that at any point in time, you're not over levered to any single company or fund. If you go to the next slide 10, um, what you'll see is what we've done to date. So we had predicted as of april 30th in the ipo you can see on the bar on the right um, that that would be our exposures what you'll see is that um, we have not been perfect in our predictions because it is highly dynamic and opportunistic based on where the deals and the opportunities come and private equity is not something that you can time but we've done a nice job in a lot of the categories matching what we thought we would do so you'll see on the bottom we today have about 12% exposure to PE co-investment deals. We've got 2% to PE primary funds, 1% to secondary funds, 28% to opportunistic to really take advantage of the COVID opportunities that have presented themselves. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then 2% um, in terms of alignment shares, which are the Pangana Capital Group shares that will be distributed at some point. Um, and then we're sitting in 54% cash today. Um, what you'll notice is that we are much larger, as I said, in the opportunistic sleeve and smaller in the secondary sleeve than we had expected at this point. But we expect those to really balance out more towards their target exposures um, as we continue through the ramp period. And we'll talk a little bit more about our secondaries fund that we are actually about to commit to, which we think will take the secondaries exposure up significantly. Um, and then some of the other funds, some of the interesting deal opportunities that are been created through the COVID situation that will increase exposure there and balance out the opportunistic. If you go to slide 11, what you'll see is that what we talked about on the last page was the amount of dollars invested in the ground or in deals. Um, what's important to understand is that we actually have to make commitments in advance of that. And so what you'll see is that while it looks like 46% of those commitments have been funded to date or are invested in private equity. Um, we actually have already committed 99% of the capital that we've raised to date. And you'll see in the dark blue bars, that's the unfunded amount. So that's the amount that we have committed to, but that the managers or we have yet to find the deals to fund those. And so private equity works where the manager only calls the capital once it finds those opportunities. And so um, we would expect that to draw over time. And so the, as Russ said, when we entered the COVID situation, we were 30% funded 
Today we're at 46% funded and we would expect that to continue to ramp quickly. Um, but the key is that we are raising more money because we've actually already committed almost all of the uh, dollars that we've raised. If we go to the next page, um, I'm gonna actually hand this over to my colleague, Corey Lepretti, who helps uh, manage our portfolio management on the private equity side. Um, and Corey, you can take it over and then I'll hop back on for the Q&A session. Th thanks, John, and, and thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us today. Um, I'll walk through the current portfolio and sort of what our, our outlook is looking like uh, over the, uh, the coming uh, weeks, months, and, and years. So it's now been close to 14 months since the launch of PE1, and we are uh, already well diversified, having committed 99% uh, of PE1's private markets portfolio to a mix of PE primaries, PE co-investments, PE secondaries, and opportunistic investments. Within our PE primary sleeve, we've made commitments of about 54 million to eight primary private equity funds, which includes seven highly oversubscribed, difficult to access middle market buyout funds, and one brand name special situations fund, uh, the Carlisle Credit Opportunities Fund, which is focused on providing privately negotiated capital solutions to non-sponsored corporates. Um, with our PE primary fund investments, we have generally targeted disciplined sector specialists that we believe have unique sourcing and operational capabilities uh, to drive value and importantly have demonstrated those capabilities over multiple market cycles. These managers that we have committed to uh, have experienced severe market downturns before and have successfully navigated through them driving value in their existing companies, while at the same time taking advantage of new opportunities as they presented themselves. Winchurch, for example, uh, which we invested in, in in February, been around for 20 plus years, and they seek to make value investments in complex, overlooked, and underperforming middle market businesses in the US and Canada. They actually straddle the line between a traditional buyout and a distressed for control investment, uh, which should enable them to be quite successful in the current environment as we expect to see uh, uh, plenty of uh, stressed businesses over the uh, the coming months. Um, another manager P1 has exposure to is HIG. They're a blue chip private equity firm. It's been around for nearly 30 years and has performed very well over multiple economic cycles. HIG's typical strategy is to buy a business with some hair on it, clean it up, and sell a better business at a better multiple than they bought it at. P1 has exposure to two of HIG's middle market buyout focus funds, one that targets uh, US companies and another one that targets European companies. Much like Winchurch, because they buy these businesses that are a little more challenged, we expect them to perform very well in the current market environment. Um, all of the middle market buyout managers we've invested in to date are historic upper quartile performers we have been investing with for many years and in many of their funds. Uh, for example, Veritas 7, which is another fund in the PE1 portfolio, is the sixth Veritas fund we've invested with. We've committed over $875 million uh, to those funds on behalf of our clients over the years. We believe these managers are very well positioned to take advantage of new opportunities with 90% of their capital still to deploy to new investments. Um, turning now to our co-investment allocation, um, our allocation to co-investments is currently being executed through a commitment to GCM Grosvenor Co-Investment Opportunities Fund 2, or GCF2. GCF2 targets co-investments alongside high quality middle market buyout managers in companies that have established revenue models, preferably in defensive sectors, such as healthcare and consumer staples. Fund held its final close as of the end of March, increasing by 40% in size to nearly $800 million uh, uh, Aussie dollars. To date, GCF2 uh, has committed uh, around $425 million to 14 companies alongside nine different sponsors. The portfolio is well diversified by industry, geography, and vintage year. Uh, the portfolio also includes four new investments that we made during this year um, before the crisis really began, and we actually have two new co-investments that we were expected to close shortly. We believe the current market should produce a number of great co-investment opportunities for GCF2, albeit at lower entry valuations and potentially on better terms than we were seeing pre-crisis. Um, with regards to the existing GCF2 portfolio, it's important to note we do not currently view any of the investments as potentially high risk due to the impact of COVID-19 or the current crisis. Uh, this is largely due in part to the more defensive nature our co-investments have taken in recent years. Investments in companies like Spice World, a supplier of fresh and processed garlic to grocery and club stores, which is a consumer staple, uh, a provider of consumer staple, and Codavity, a provider of payment accuracy solutions focused on the healthcare industry. These are examples of the more defensive strategy that we pursued as we saw ourselves sort of in the late stages of the economic cycle. Now, it doesn't mean there won't be any impact evaluations, at least in the short term, and as we'll, we'll come to in another slide, you'll see in, in March, we think things bottomed out a bit. For example, one of the companies, Vera Mobility, is a major uh, provider of toll management solutions to rental car companies in North America. With travel grinding to a halt, the car rental industry has been hit really hard. However, that company had an ample liquidity, low leverage, uh, and expects business to return to normal now that the stay-at-home restrictions have begun to be lifted. Um, 
Turning now to the secondary sleeve, uh, in February, we completed our first secondary transaction out of our dedicated secondary sleeve, purchasing interest in four funds managed by Alpine Investors, which is a fund manager that focuses on the software and services sector in North America. Um, this transaction was generally consistent with our strategy of targeting niche secondary opportunities with difficult to access, strong performing managers where GCM has an existing relationship. Um, and as I'll speak to a little bit later on the opportunity slide, we expect that the current environment will yield a number of high quality secondary opportunities that PE1 is well positioned to take advantage of given how disciplined we have been in deploying our secondary capital to date. Finally, um, our opportunistic allocation that one's being currently being executed through a commitment uh, to uh, GCM Grosvenor Multi-Asset Class Fund 2, or MAC2. As a reminder, MAC2 is the flexibility to invest across GCM's entire alternatives uh, platform, opportunistically choosing the best deals from whatever sourcing channel they come from. It is effectively an over-allocation strategy that overlays the entire GCM platform, looks to cherry-pick the best deals, and has its own separate investment committee that chooses which deals to put in it. MAC2 entered the current crisis with about 43% of its capital uh, total capital commitments called. 30% of that capital has actually been invested in businesses that have been positively impacted by COVID-19. One of these investments, which many of you have probably heard me talk about before, or Fred for that matter, is Instacart. It's an uh, online grocery delivery service that's a solution for existing grocer, uh, grocers. Um, while indicators of that business were quite strong before the current crisis with 100% plus growth volumes, they've been experiencing higher than anticipated demand due to the stay at home restrictions. Previously, uh, only 5% of grocery spend was online, um, but adoption expected in the next several years by the company occurred during April and May, uh, so obviously in a much more condensed period due to the shelter-in-place restrictions uh, instituted across the United States. Uh, Instacart has added millions of new customers since the COVID-19 crisis began and has really ramped up its workforce, hiring 300,000 net new shoppers to meet the increased demand. Um, we were actually able to increase MAC2's interest in Instacart in April, purchasing an interest from a distressed seller at the same valuation uh, we entered the company at back in October 2018. And just earlier this month, uh, Instacart actually completed a new financing round at a valuation that was significantly higher than the valuation we invested at, uh, which is very positive for uh, the performance of, of Mac coming forward. Um, Mac2 has also been quite uh, active since the crisis began, deploying another 30% of total commitments into attractive opportunities that presented themselves. Two of these were private equity co-investments alongside leading managers and defensive businesses at attractive valuations that we believe are insulated for COVID-19 impact. So all told, uh, we are pretty happy with the way the portfolio is shaping up to date. And we look forward to continuing to build out the portfolio over the com coming months and years and taking advantage of the opportunities we expect to see uh, uh, going forward. All right, we move on to slide uh, uh, six, 16, I guess it is, right? Sorry, slide 14. All right, so um, the impact of COVID-19 on, on the PE market. Um, so we, we certainly believe, uh, and we think we've been successful in doing that here with PE1, that those investors that partnered with those cycle-tested managers who've proven their ability um, to be successful over multiple economic cycle and who have the appropriate levels of diversification in their portfolios will be better positioned to weather the current crisis. Um, and so over the long term, we, do, we also believe that the current dislocation is going to create a ton of high-quality opportunities uh, for strong private equity managers uh, who understand the uh, market dynamics and who are the sector specialists that we, uh, we target. Private investments themselves can tend to be better insulated from uh, overreaction caused by panic. Um, they don't, uh, private equity managers do not have to respond to, uh, uh, to shareholder demands. They're not worried about people uh, trying to sell out of their uh, fund. They're not uh, working towards a, a share price. Um, latest valuations for our fund are during the, the peak of uncertainty. Um, and uh, Obviously, as, as of Q1, uh, the public markets fell uh, precipitously with the S&P down 20%. Russell 2000 was down uh, uh, 30%. Private equity is not, uh, is not perfectly correlated with those markets and certainly won't go down as much. And we've certainly seen the public markets uh, see strong recoveries in Q2. Um, so what do we expect to see? Certainly, um, we expect um, the impact of COVID-19 and the impact on the oil and, and gas industry by, by those dynamics um, to impact the market generally. We expect valuations to come down. Um, we expect to have a greater ability to negotiate uh, better deal terms. Um, we expect um, there to be easy opportunities to get more leverage and we expect the pace of fundraising um, to, uh, uh, to decline for a, a bit of time uh, as managers assess their existing portfolios um, and look uh, to make sure that, that, that those portfolios are sound and then look for new opportunities um, as valuations reset themselves. Um, I think we can, if we flip to uh, slide 15, because I think it illustrates the last point on the slide. Ultimately, um, 
private equity uh, uh, in different markets. This slide illustrates how it's done in different parts of the market cycles by looking at pooled returns for funds formed before the global financial crisis, during it, and immediately after. Not only did private equity hold its uh, outperformance versus the public markets pre-crisis, um, it was more resilient during the crisis, and it continued to perform uh, post-crisis. And now, I think we can debate exactly where we are on the slide in this point in time, but given the evergreen nature of PE1 and the fact that it currently has so much capital left to invest, uh, we believe P1 is more likely to resemble the right side of the slide uh, than the left, um, and, uh, and we would expect it to uh, perform quite well uh, taking advantage of new opportunities that present themselves. Um, one other thing I will note, um, this slide actually looks at, uh, at pooled returns. Um, the types of returns we target and the managers we invest in, as I noted before, are, are typically and historically upper quartile performers, and so the dispersion uh, in returns is, is much greater than that, which is even illustrated here on this slide. Okay, turning just to the outlook um, on the next slide, we, we certainly anticipate increase in value over underlying investments over the coming months. Um, much like the public markets, uh, everything dipped uh, through, uh, through March 31st. Uh, we've seen a rebound in, in a number of our investments, and then you have investments like, uh, like Instacart that I talked to before, uh, whose valuation is, is, is two times uh, the, uh, the valuation that we purchased in at. Um, so that should have a, a, a very nice pop in the portfolio. Um, and so uh, even though it's not illustrated as much here, um, we found that our portfolio is likely bottomed out uh, in, in late March and, uh, and expect us to continue to see a, a strong uh, uptick in performance over the, uh, over the coming months. Looking then to the primary outlook on 17, I'll talk about what we're seeing in opportunities. Um, certainly, um, we would expect to see, uh, uh, as we did back in the GFC, excuse me, uh, we saw a lot of leverage issues with, um, with a number of the funds, um, um, and they were having a difficult time. They were tripping covenants, um, and it was causing uh, bankruptcies in their companies and the like. This time, uh, given uh, the covenant light uh, nature of many of the loans that, um, that our managers have, uh, we'd expect um, them to have, be able to uh, weather the storm better uh, and be able to utilize this working capital to, uh, to fund their businesses. Um, we also have, as, as I noted, we, these managers are really focused on, uh, on liquidity in their portfolio and backstopping the companies that they have uh, and making sure those are short up before exploring new investments. Um, in our portfolio, there's been very little capital that's been deployed. So these managers are going to be spending a good deal of time focusing on uh, where the really good opportunities are to buy businesses that are uh, slightly just dis, uh, distressed um, that they can really uh, fix up uh, in use operational improvements to improve um, and then uh, and then move them forward to sell them at a, at a higher value um, to that to that extent we also expect them to be able to purchase uh, many under optimized uh, businesses um, using corporate carve outs and the like and actually doing a, a accretive um, add-ons to uh, the companies that they have where they're able to pick up companies that are uh, complementary to the businesses that they have in their portfolio um, and, uh, and are able to, uh, to do them at, a, at an interesting price uh, uh, that they will be able to uh, then increase the total value of the companies and sell them for a, uh, for a nice profit once we come out of the, uh, the downturn. Finally, uh, as I noted before, we would expect fundraising to slow, uh, especially for first-time funds, um, as managers uh, uh, wait to see uh, sort of where we come out, and as limited partners um, wait to observe where valuations land. At the end of the day, um, manager selection is, is ultimately critical, uh, and we feel uh, feel confident that the managers we've selected to date, uh, who've been doing this for a long time, are, are well positioned to be successful. Turning now to uh, slide uh, 18 uh, and the co-investment outlook. Um, so certainly, quarantines and other restrictions uh, drove a sharp a sharp fall in spending. Um, consumer retail was always hit particularly hard, as was the uh, travel and uh, and, and retail uh, industries. Um, companies now here are really focused on, on workforce protection and productivity, managing their liquidity risk and stabilizing the operations uh, uh, so they're prepared for recovery and growth. Um, we have seen a slowdown in new co-investment deal activity as managers focus on their existing portfolio companies, but that was really seen in the, uh, in the March, April, May time period. We've started to see an uptick uh, in deal activity uh, uh, to date. It's evidenced by a couple of deals that we're getting ready to close. Um, but we're finding that um, uh, valuations have come down, have already started to come down, and that uh, we're able to negotiate better terms because we have a stronger um, uh, negotiating position than we did. Um, finally, um, we think that there are going to be uh, uh, some real opportunities uh, in, um, in more of the defensive sectors, which we targeted before, um, things like healthcare and technology companies. Um, really, they're going to be focusing on um, technology uh, um, that is going to uh, reduce overhead costs 
uh, rather than growth uh, growth uh, focused uh, technology. Um, and you're going to find uh, companies that are going to require capital. Uh, they can't defer fundraising uh, or, or they'll risk failing. And so there'll be really good opportunities to come in and participate in those companies. And finally, on the secondary spot uh, part of the market, um, and in, in some respects, um, you know, we, we actually are somewhat uh, lucky because we were disciplined before and we did not deploy a ton of capital. This is where we would expect to see a, um, a, a ton of activity sort of later this year. Um, there's been a slowdown to date which was expected uh, since um, secondaries price over, uh, over valuations that are uh, delayed. Um, so most secondary transactions that would be pricing now are on Q1 valuations and, and folks, including ourselves, uh, would be reluctant to transact on those different prices. However, you're going to have a large increase in motivated sellers, people who need to create liquidity uh, in their portfolios, or those uh, who, as a result of declines in the values of their equity portfolios, become over allocated to private equity. And so they're required to, uh, to sell portions of their private equity portfolio to rebalance their portfolios, and they end up doing them at a more significant discount uh, than we would have uh, seen before. We think that there's going to be opportunities to provide structured uh, uh, equity solutions where we're uh, making deals to enable LPs to fund their capital calls in exchange for preferred distributions. Um, we think manager-led transactions. Uh, these are typically happening when managers are nearing the end of the lives of their funds. Um, and given where the current market is, they don't want to sell out their portfolios at a, at a fire sale or at a distressed pricing. So what they're going to do is look to have um, uh, secondary buyers come in, um, purchase, uh, purchase interest in these portfolios uh, and these continuation funds to buy out the existing uh, investors and provide liquidity. And so we're seeing a lot more of those. Um, and then finally, we think there's going to be some really good opportunities to purchase younger secondaries which have um, more, uh, more opportunity for, for greater multiple expansion, um, given that they'll be uh, uh, not as uh, developed in their portfolios as the secondaries that we typically would invest in. And then finally, from a fundraising perspective, um, we're seeing secondary funds still raising capital at, a, at an enormous rate. Um, candidly, many of the best performing secondaries were those that invested right after the GFC. Um, and uh, we're, we're expecting to see uh, that same wave of really great opportunities and opportunities to purchase at, uh, at more significant discount than we were seeing in the uh, uh, before the crisis uh, develop as we move on uh, later into this year and into next year. So in summary, um, Russ, do you want to take this back or you want me to take this one? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll take it back. Thanks, Corey, and thanks, John. Uh, so uh, in summary, uh, we think P1 uh, is indeed a unique uh, investment uh, vehicle uh, granting access uh, to uh, some very high quality uh, private equity managers and deals around the world and uh, doing that through an ASX listed vehicle um, is, uh, certainly enhances uh, the attractiveness of it. Um, the funds that we are raising, just to stress once again, uh, should result in value accretion uh, to our unit holders and that's because of the great opportunities that are presenting themselves in the marketplace at the moment uh, through the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. To mention the, the pricing of the deal is done at NAV. Uh, this is attractive. Uh, the reason for that being a that the vehicle has or the units have traded traditionally at a premium to the NAV, but also because we expect, um, based upon um, what's happened in the market since March, we expect uh, that the um, some positive developments uh, in the um, uh, in the valuations over the um, as as the valuations since March uh, come through and Corey. Um, spoke about Instacart, that would just be one example, but a you know, very good one, probably the, the biggest single impact uh, on the positive side on, on our portfolio. Um, and um, just once again, just to stress, offer closes uh, on 6th of July. Um, it's, it's, been, it's a short uh, uh, open period, so please uh, keep your eye on that. Um, I uh, am going to now hand over to my colleague, um, Adam Myers, um, who runs our distribution business. Uh, to um, uh, for the Q and A session. So, Adam, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Um, we have a number of questions. I'm going to try and sort them. Um, they've, they've come in thick and fast, but I'm going to do my best to try and sort them into a sort of a, a logical order. And if you don't hear your exact question asked, it's probably because I've combined one or two questions that are along a similar theme. Um, but the first question is around the current share price performance. Obviously, the premium has closed somewhat in the last few days. Russell, would you like to address that question? Uh, sure, thanks, Adam. So uh, the premium has uh, has come come in somewhat um, since we announced the raising. 
Um, we um, anticipate we anticipated that this might happen, but really um, think that it's a short-term phenomena. Uh, the reason why this happens sometimes during the offer period uh, is that not all investors can take up their rights. Uh, so sometimes what they might do, and, and let's say for instance, an example of that might be somebody um, who has too much of this in their portfolio uh, because uh, from a platform uh, level, they are only allowed to have a certain amount and if they acquire their rights, that would take them over the, um, their, their limit. Uh, so um, what happens in this situation, sometimes those investors um, are uh, forced to sell out uh, during the um, offer period in order to enable them to take up their, their rights, which is obviously at a discount to the, to the trader price. So we do um, very often during these, um, these periods find pressure on the price, uh, but we would hope and anticipate that once the offer is finished, we revert to um, the sorts of premiums uh, that um, that we're experiencing, uh, you know, over the uh, you know, basically over the last year or so. Thanks, Russell. Um, the next question is also for you. Um, earlier this year, we had a two for one um, offer, and this time we are offering one for three. Please, can you explain your thinking? Yes, yeah, so um, the uh, two for one offer um, was obviously a much larger raising that would have raised up to 400 million. Uh, here we're looking at a, just slightly under $70 million. So this is a small uh, uh, piece of what we were anticipating uh, or what we were aiming for before. Um, and really our focus here is on existing investors, making sure uh, that we give existing investors an opportunity to put more money to work. I don't believe that it's an environment uh, to go out and raise a large amount of money. The markets are still uh, quite quite fragile, um, and uh, we also so so we didn't want to go out with a um, with a massive raising. We just wanted to focus uh, on giving our existing investors the opportunity. Uh, and we also know that uh, in order to do a rights issue, we could get this done uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, uh, because we can do it without uh, without the need for um, a um, for a PDS, and um, we could be in the market quickly. We want to get into the market quickly because these opportunities to invest are presenting themselves each and every day. Now there is a um, I mean immediacy uh, to this, um, and so we want to make it quick and efficient, and that's why we've gone out just with the rights raising. We think that um, keeping it tight, just at um, uh, just under seventy million dollars will continue to uh, support a, a strong demand uh, supply uh, balance over the uh, over the coming months and years. Thank you, Russell. Um, Corey, this question's for you. Um, can you explain the valuation policy and the process that GCM undertakes to ensure fair and accurate, fair and accurate valuations in the portfolio? Yeah, I certainly can. I actually may, uh, I, I could do it. I, I think actually John, who sits on our valuation committee, um, may be well placed to talk about sort of how we go through our, our valuations uh, uh, from a regular perspective. Sure. So uh, thanks, Corey. Um, so I sit on our valuation committee, which is made up of independent non-investment team members, uh, where on a quarterly basis, we look at all of our, in both our fund investments as well as our co-investments. Um, and make sure that we're comfortable with how the managers are marking it. And for those that we don't have managers, um, that we, you know, set prices that are, you know, defensible and comfortable and conservative. Um, the, what we do is that um, we use the best available information. So in private equity, it is uh, very common in the market and market standard for there to be a lag of information because these are private companies. And so as the financials are put out, and then valuations are sent from the managers to um, managers like us, that takes some time to process. And so what we typically do is on any period of time, um, we take the best available information based on a cutoff date. Um, what that looks like is that our fund investments are more delayed than our co-investments. The co-investments, we typically have um, more real-time information as to the company's underlying financials as of the last quarter. And then we have market multiples and data points and subsequent events and material events that we use to kind of roll those forward so, the, the, so that they are live. And um, on a fund perspective, what we do is we receive the PCAPs from the managers, which are the official valuation statements. And then um, we bring those forward using any um, distributions or calls or subsequent cash flows to kind of bring them forward, but they still are on a delay. And so that is why um, as Russell said, 
the May valuation you'll see has the 331 marks in it because we are effectively pulling forward those uh, PCAPs that we've received and uh, fund values. And so we also, um, just to be extra careful, we use two third-party valuation firms, Dauphin Phelps and VRC, so that every co-investment um, is not only underwritten by our investment team as well as the manager, but that we have a third independent party look at them at least once a year to make sure that they are comfortable. And um, one can be assured that this is a very robust process. Um, the U.S. Uh, regulators, the SEC, pays a lot of attention to this and they want to make sure that everyone is treated in a fair and equitable approach. Um, and uh, we feel very good about it and are happy to kind of give any more detail to anyone that would want um, off of the webinar, as I know we've had some uh, other questions. Corey, before we finish, I don't know if also you just want to address the fair and allocable allocation process really quickly. Yeah, it's, it's certainly happy to. And um, so one other thing to note for us and um, something we uh, we treat uh, as very important, um, as investment opportunities come into uh, uh, into the Grosvenor universe, um, we basically treat uh, every investor the same, um, and we have a, a strict pro rata allocation policy. So we look at um, investor uh, all of the programs that we manage uh, that have capital uh, available for a particular strategy, and then we take that uh, that opportunity and we roll it through um, through all of uh, all of our uh, the programs that have uh, have have capacity pro rata. Um, why that's important is that um, PE1 uh, is treated as it, uh, much like any other large client that we manage capital for. Um, and they get their allocation based on uh, purely on, on their size. Doesn't matter if we've had uh, clients who've been with us for uh, 20 years uh, and invested uh, billions of dollars with us. Um, they get the same allocations based upon you know the amount of capital that we're ma currently managing for them in a particular strategy. So uh, that way we we ensure that we avoid conflicts um, and that we're treating each of our investors uh, consistently and, and and fairly across each of our products. And it's the reason that uh, PE1 has been able to get access to all of these highly oversubscribed. Uh, middle market buyout funds and other investments uh, because uh, they're getting the benefit of the uh, allocations that we are receiving from these funds uh, based on the years of uh, that we've been investing with them. And I would just say, just to hammer that point home, um, if you look at it, what that means is that an individual retail investor um, or advisor in PE1 is effectively being treated and given the same opportunities that a super fund or a sovereign wealth fund that puts billions of dollars to work with us. And so it's a really unique kind of structure and opportunity that the Grosvenor platform kind of provides. Thanks, Jens. I think this leads well to the next question, which is, do GCM consider this the optimal way to invest in private equity? And would you invest in the fund if it was available to you? Um, sure. Yeah, we both, can, I think Corey and I can both give our opinions on this. Um, it, it's an interesting question. I, um, a lot of what you see in private equity is not what we call an evergreen fund. And so it's a closed fund where you effectively make commitments over a, a handful of periods and then it's usually kind of sits there for almost 10 to 15 years as those deals are harvested. And so in order to keep your exposure up in private equity, you effectively have to have new commitments and new funds or programs consistently every three, four years. And we see that with a lot of our institutional clients and it's, a, it's somewhat of a burden. Um, the evergreen structure here I think is really unique and optimal because it allows you to keep that exposure throughout the cycle and as we said it's impossible to time in private equity wh when you want to be in um you know the event we take a very kind of balanced vintage diversification approach so that you always have uh, exposure to private equity right before the cycle breaks and right after the cycle breaks and we don't try and kind of time it tremendously and so PE1 in its structure really allows you to keep that balanced exposure, which really provides the best opportunity to capture a through the cycle PE return, which is really the goal here and what any retail investor or advisor should want as an asset allocation solution. And so um, just a personal opinion, not from Grosvenor, but um, I think it's a tremendous product and I think the liquidity is also very unique and uh, an added feature that is really attractive. Corey? Yeah, I, I agree with everything John said. And I'll say one other thing. Typically, you know, because of the amount that you would have to invest to get access to a private equity fund, 
um, the opportunities that are available to the, the high net worth uh, and, and retail clients are, are very limited. Um, those opportunities tend to be, you know, very concentrated portfolios or um, single manager uh, feeders, right, which is not the optimal way to uh, construct a private equity portfolio. What you want to be doing when you construct a PE portfolio is having a, a well-diversified portfolio that has a uh, um, significant vintage year diversification, um, has acts, uh, the diversification from a geographic perspective. It's a uh, manager diversification and um, diversification by strategy. PE1 was constructed to have you know, exposure once we hit our, our long-term portfolio of over 90 funds and, and nearly 500 companies. Um, and they're going to be across uh, buyouts, special situations, uh, maybe a little bit of, bit of growth. We're going to have uh, you know, maybe up to 20 years of vintage year exposure due to our primary fund investments that give us forward-looking diversification. And then you're getting significant backward uh, diversification from the secondaries. So I'm gaining access to this. Um, typically, you know, you'd have to put in, uh, um, you know, for, for us, uh, you know, a big sort of a standard separate account is 50 or $100 million. And to be able to get access to this in a well-diversified portfolio where you have liquidity, it's very, very hard to find. And um, I like what John said, uh, you know, it can't say it on behalf of Grosvenor, but it's certainly the way I would want to access uh, uh, private equity uh, uh, if I were putting my money out uh, as, as, a, as, a, as an individual investor. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, the next question is going to be asked in two parts. Firstly, um, you have spoken about Instacart, for example, which has been a great beneficiary of the crisis. Are there other examples that you can mention who have A, benefited and B, suffered um, in the, the recent environment? And the second part of the, the question is, what is your confidence in the U.S. economy, given the fund's focus on U.S. investments? Um, leading into the the u.s elections um and you know subsequent to you know managing the the the, the COVID crisis um how do you think that the economy is going to handle all of these challenges corey why don't you start out with part one uh talking about some companies that have benefited as well as you know been hurt by the COVID crisis yeah, no, I mean, uh, obviously, um, um, there were going to be some challenges. On the primary side, you weren't going to find um, uh, much there. Um, candidly, uh, because uh, only about 10% of that was deployed, uh, most of that through through the Carlisle Credit Fund, um, we weren't impacted very much. And, and again, given these because these managers are, are quite cycle-tested, uh, we expect them to find really great opportunities. But even Carlisle and credit was hit particularly hard, as most people know, in March. Um, they were only down about 7%. They had uh, four companies that uh, had exposure to travel and leisure uh, uh, and, and, and one that had a headquarters in, in, in Italy. Um, so uh, we expect those to rebound uh, nicely. Um, in our co-investment portfolio, um, as I noted before, we actually think we have some, some very good investments um, given the defensive nature of what we're doing. I mentioned uh, Codavity, uh, which uh, is, that, is a payment accuracy solution provider to healthcare, uh, uh, to the healthcare industry. They actually uh, help uh, reduce fraud in the industry and reduce overall costs by getting rid of unnecessary surgeries. That that business is poised to do quite well. Um, you know, I mentioned Vera before. Um, you know, given that they're a toll provider to uh, uh, to car rental agencies, they they were hit uh, fairly hard, um, but they've rebounded uh, quite nicely um, uh, along with the market uh, through uh, April and uh, April and May. Um, and uh, I mean, we have a, a few that companies that are focused on logistics, for example. Um, and so obviously with uh, with less travel um, uh, and, and people getting sick and the ability to uh, con continue to, to send goods across the country, that was reduced for a while. But those are essential businesses uh, that we expect to uh, to recover strongly. Um, in Mac, um, I can mention uh, one of the other investments. Uh, there's an investment uh, in, uh, in a company called Lineage Logistics. They're a uh, cold storage provider, basically uh, sit between... Um, the uh, food industry um, and, uh, and 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 grocers or, or the end customers now. Um, there's been obviously a, uh, with everybody staying at home, people going out to restaurants less. There's been a ton of need for uh, for the cold storage business and for a place for the farmers to send their food. So they've actually been positively impacted uh, throughout this period. Um, so we actually think that um, uh, many of the investments in our portfolio, uh, even those ones that took an initial dip, uh, will end up uh, recovering quite nicely. Um, and um, you know, because a lot of the uh, we have so much capital to deploy across the portfolio, um, we think that um, you know for some of those other businesses that would be more distressed if you had been significantly invested, we'll have the opportunity uh, to either directly through Mac or, or a co-investment fund or through our funds to pick up those companies at lower valuations, which should be able to drive uh, drive nice returns uh, as we come out of the other side of the uh, the crisis. Thanks. 
Um, I, I would just say to the second question, um, I don't think Corey or I, you know, would say we're global economists, but, um, you know, we're a little biased, but I think we do still believe in the U.S. economy over the long term. And I think what the COVID crisis has really shown us all, whether you're in Australia, Europe, uh, Asia, the U.S., is how connected the world is. And so, um, you know, it's, I think it's hard to just isolate one area in a crisis such as this and not have impacts that roll through a lot of different economies. Um, different, you know, governments have clearly handled the COVID crisis better than others. Um, and that will have impacts, but I think that's probably a shorter term impact than a longer term impact. I would say if you look at private equity and the role of private equity, you know, there are times obviously when banks stop lending and, you know, private equity becomes the capital of last resort. And so um, tremendous opportunities pre present ourselves, um, you know, by in those types of situations. And we think that we are either in one of those or, you know, close to one of those in what has happened over the last few months. While the global equity markets have clearly popped back up, there is a lot of pain and carnage in the private company world. And we think that there's a lot of opportunity there. And PE1 is incredibly fortunate that it only had, you know, 30% of capital actually deployed at that point. Um, if you look at industries that we specialize in with our managers, whether it's technology or healthcare, we think there's tremendous opportunity in the US economy still. Um, and remember, we're really playing in the middle market. So innovation plays a key role here. And we think that, you know, that will only continue. And the US has shown that over time. And then lastly, I'll say interest rate policy. Um, you know, our government while maybe this will be painful in the long run, has created an environment where interest rates are really encouraging, you know, a lot of activity right now. And, you know, a lot of the private equity model, you know, does include leverage. And so when interest rates are incredibly low and you have these unique opportunities where you have people who have to sell businesses for liquidity, um, it presents really unique opportunities to generate returns in excess of the average cycle. And so, all of that put together, I think long term, we still feel really good about it. Um, I will point everyone to the fact that we are a global business. We have offices in London, Seoul, Tokyo, Hong Kong, um, and we invest all over those regions. And so PE1 will have, you know, about probably 60 to 70 percent in the U.S. right now, but it's dynamic. And so if we see great opportunities in Europe or Asia, we'll kind of move in that direction over time. And so uh, I still think the vehicle's in a really good spot. And I think over the long term, my personal view is that the U.S. will be a good place to invest in the middle market. Corey, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Yeah, and the only only point he's quite right. And if you look back at the uh, at the dot com bubble burst, uh, as well as the the GFC, uh, you would have, might have had some of the same concerns, and, and the returns coming out of those were uh, were tremendous. In fact, I mean, the one thing you always have to know with private equity, it's you're playing for the long term, um, and so you, you can't time it. Um, so you can make some tactical allocation shifts, which is what we've done for uh, for our co investments, looking at more defensive uh, sectors and the like. But you really are looking at the uh, the longer term play. Um, and the nice thing for these PE managers, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, they get to hold these companies and they can work on just improving them until the market dynamics uh, uh, get better. And they can pick up companies that are, are distressed and do accretive add ons to make their companies uh, more powerful so that when they ultimately sell them, they can uh, get a nicer return. Plus, um, the companies, as John noted, that we're looking at are in the middle market. So we're not reliant on the IPO market uh, to sell these companies. Uh, I'd probably be a little bit more more nervous if uh, we were selling out and having to rely on those IPO markets, which are uh, um, inconsistent, uh, uh, certainly currently, uh, and, and, and have been choppy uh, over time. For us, we're selling to other strategic buyers. There are tons of private equity firms, candidly, out there that have other capital who are slightly higher up in the uh, in the chain, including some of the big ones who will need to then come and, and buy be the strategic buyers for the companies that our private equity uh, uh, funds are looking to sell. Very thoughtful responses. Thank you very much. Um, the next question relates to fees. Can you please just remind our listeners about the fees, both at trust level and the underlying manager fees? Sure. So we, we have two layers of fees here. So at the trust level, we have a one and a quarter percent management fee, which is shared between Pangana and Grosvenor. And we have a performance fee, which is 20% over an 8% uh, annualized uh, hurdle. 
Um, we think that that really aligns us and Pangana well with investors um, and is similar to what you see a lot in private equity where the managers typically have 8% preferred returns before they earn their performance fees. And so uh, that's at the trust level. Um, obviously, when we invest in the managers beneath that or Grosvenor funds that are holding the co-investments per se, um, because those are individual deals that we bundle up um, through the platform, um, there are different fee structures for all of those. And so um, we effectively get uh, some discount because of our scale that we pass along to the PE1 investors. And then we roll those up. Um, so that's the second layer of fees. And so um, a manager effectively has to generate that 8% preferred return before they'll get paid. And then we at the trust level have to, in aggregate, earn over that 8% to make any performance fees. So there are multiple layers of protection um, to allow hopefully double digit type returns. Great, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> An interesting question from from somebody here who isn't familiar with a lot of the the jargon that is used in um, discussing private equity. Um, John, earlier on you were talking about PCAPs, um, but um, she refers to um, slide 12 where we have um, headings. Perhaps we can just go back to that slide and we can um, sure. cover cover off on a on a couple of those. Mm -hmm. Um, vintage years, funded amounts, et cetera, and just describe a little bit of, of what you mean by, you know, by, by this particular jargon. Sure. Corey, you want to take that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and apologies for using uh, jargon. Um, uh, so vintage year um, is uh, typically the year that um, the fund starts making investments. So for a private equity fund, um, usually it is the year that they launch their funds. There are some funds, let's say they were launched, say, in, in late 2019 and didn't make their first investment until 2020. They would be a 2020 vintage year fund rather than a 2019, but it refers to the year that they start making their investments. Private equity funds typically deploy their capital over a three to five year period. So a, 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 say a, a VISTA that you see on that page at the top, uh, which is a 2019 fund, um, while 2019 would be when their first investment was made, it was actually made in September, they, you would ex expect them to deploy capital to new investments in 2020, 2021, and, and, and probably 2022. Um, earliest commitment date, and that's the commitment date that uh, we made an, uh, an investment. Um, typically, there would only be one, uh, one commitment date. Um, here, we actually uh, uh, upsized by, by a few million uh, dollars our commitment to Veritas Capital uh, in, uh, in in October, I believe. So uh, the August was when we made our first initial commitment, but that refers to when PE1 committed to the individual transactions. Um, the committed amount and the funded amount refer to when you invest in a private equity fund, you have a commitment amount and then that amount is drawn down over a period of time with most of it going down in the first as, over that commitment period where they're making new investments over three to five years. Um, and as that money is drawn down, um, or actually invested into investments, it becomes a funded amount. So if you were to look at Vista, for example, the commitment, uh, committed amount is $6 million. We funded $500,000, it was some expenses, and there was one deal that, that occurred uh, late last year in that portfolio. Our remaining amount that we have to uh, uh, have called down from us that we've committed is about $5.5 million. Um, and then distributions reflect the distributions that come out from the fund. Uh, during the life, and obviously those continue to go up as as investments get harvested um, in the uh, in the later years of a private equity fund. Thanks, Corey. Um, you guys um, took us through the opportunity for secondaries, but we understand that it is particularly compelling at the moment. Um, can you please just um, remind us again about the um, the reasons why um, investors may be looking to dispose of um, positions that they are currently holding in private equity and why this creates an opportunity for, for Grosvenor? I'll start off and I'll hand it over to Corey. Um, so, so we see a lot of different reasons why um, there are sellers in the market. And so I'll give a couple of kind of tangible examples. Um, think of a you know, future fund or sovereign fund that is undergoing a management change. There's a new chief investment officer um, because private equity is so long dated, the average fund hold period or existence is almost 10 to 15 years. 
if you come in as a new CIO, you are going to be inheriting a very large book of prior private equity commitments to managers and deals. Um, what you often find is that people want to wipe the slate clean and start their own track record or their own investments. So we often find large institutions, pension plans, um, family offices um, that want to effectively get rid of those uh, prior deals and look for new ones. And so they will often sell those at a discount to someone like us, Grosvenor. Um, second example is you have a high net worth family who has invested in one fund and that fund made seven investments over the, over its life and six of them have been harvested and it's gone well, or maybe it hasn't, but there's only one, one investment left. But that one investment doesn't appear to have any clear kind of timeline or line of sight to when it will be exited. Um, you often will find people that want to clean up their book or effectively say, I've made good money in the six. I want to redeploy this capital. I want to change the strategy. I need money for something else, another manager or something outside of private equity. I will sell the remaining interest, LP interest in that fund. And so Grosvenor has an opportunity to analyze and assess the timing and the value of what it is purchasing, what's left in the fund. Those are just two um, examples and we could go on and on as to why people are forced sellers in the market effectively. Um, and Grosvenor's platform is what really creates the opportunities. And so because we've invested in over 600 funds over our life of over almost 20 years, um, we have relationships with so many managers that often there's what's called manager consent rights. And so when an, a limited in partner or investor wants to sell their stake in a fund, um, they need to go to that manager and get its approval to sell. It's not like a hedge fund or a stock where you can just decide that you want to get out based on redemption terms. Private equity really doesn't offer liquidity outside of secondaries. And so what ends up happening is that those managers often are approaching some of their largest investors that they are very comfortable with um, to say, hey, we know Grosvenor has a practice that focuses on secondaries. We know that they have expertise, they have capital ready to deploy in secondaries, and we're very comfortable with them. And they're not going to force us to do anything um, re-underwriting our business since they're already invested in the fund. And so we often are brought a lot of opportunities through that channel. And then there obviously are other ones that we go out and look for ourselves. And so those are just some tangible examples of how the platform kind of finds those four sellers and the opportunities that we get. Um, Corey, I don't know if you want to add any more detail. I might, I might just add something, uh, John, uh, that, that would be interesting to, to the audience, I think, and that is that um, in market corrections where asset prices go down, you very often find private equity usually doesn't go down as much as, um, uh, as much as other assets. And so what you find is that the big institutions are overweight private equity in their portfolios. And some of them have specific mandates. For instance, they're not allowed to have more than 20% of their portfolio in private equity. The rest of the portfolio has reduced in value. And so private equity might be now 25% of the portfolio. They are four sellers. They might not, they might love the assets that are sitting there, but um, their charter requires them to sell the assets. So we find uh, that a lot of the a lot of the flow that we're seeing or we expect to see over the coming uh, months and years will be because of these um, types of forced um, activities. So that that's something that that we're very excited about. Um, great, thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we are going to wind up um, Q&A. If we haven't responded to your question, um, we will respond to you separately. Um, thank you for joining us for this update today. We think that the opportunity is extremely compelling at the moment. Firstly, because the price re reflects the valuations at the time of peak crisis uncertainty before governments had stepped in um, and before the world better understood how to manage the spread of the virus. And secondly, because GCM have an abundance of opportunities at the moment um, and the capital will be will be put into very, very accretive investment opportunities which have been created by this dislocation. Um, so thank you for joining us. A recording of this webinar will be sent to all investors. And if you have any other questions, please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank <music> you.